talking about the Chilcot Inquiry. Let me take you back to the 15th of February 2003, when two million people marched against the proposed invasion of Iraq. I, like many of you, got the bus down from Leeds to London. I, like many of you, marched with two million other people. And I, like many of you, saw Jeremy Corbyn speak in Hyde Park in London that day. And I heard Jeremy Corbyn, who I'd never seen speak before, talk about his fears of what would happen in Iraq, what would happen in the Middle East, and what would happen around the world if we made the grave mistake of supporting George Bush's proposed invasion of Iraq. And on that day, on the 15th of February 2003, I never imagined that one day I'd be the Labour Socialist Member of Parliament for the area I'm from. On that day, on the 15th of February 2003, I never imagined that the man I saw speaking that day, Jeremy Corbyn, would be elected all those years later as our first leader. I never imagined that all those years later I'd be sat on the front bench in Parliament, not too far from Dennis Skinner, on the day that the leader of the Labour Party stood up and apologised to the people of Iraq, apologised to the British people, apologised to the families of British servicemen and British service women for the decision of the previous Labour leader, Tony Blair, to support George Bush's invasion of Iraq. And the truth is, sisters and brothers, that there are those in the establishment, in Westminster, in the media, and maybe even a bit closer to home, that didn't want Jeremy Corbyn to be Labour leader at all, but didn't want him to be Labour leader on the day that the Iraq inquiry was published. So that's a rather long, rambling way of me getting round to the point of saying that without each and every single one of you, there would have been a Labour leader making that apology on that day. History was made. History was made. And the world, listen, if it wasn't for you, it wouldn't have happened. So only people can make history, not just in this country, but around the world. And the good news is that the history-making process in which you're so intimately involved isn't over yet. There's a lot more history to be made by you and a lot more socialist history to be made as well. So I don't think, looking around this room, that you're a bad bunch. <laughs> Whatever other people say. The struggle that got me interested 
in politics, interested in class politics, interested in socialism, was the miners' strike. And who can forget the way that striking miners, women against pit closure activists, were all denounced by the establishment as brick throwers, as thugs, as bullies, and in the case of miners, as misogynists. It was totally wrong, it was totally unfair, and it was designed to turn people against them. It was designed to turn the public against them. Their only crime in the eyes of the establishment was to be a group of working class people getting together to organise for a better society and to take on the ruling elite. So, in 2016, I and others are not going to stand by whilst all of you decent women and men in this room and across the country are decried as thugs, brick throwers, misogynists and bullies. It's simply not right. It's simply morally wrong to call hundreds of thousands of people those names. It's simply wrong to dismiss and demonise hundreds of thousands of decent people in that way. Of course it's important that MPs aren't abused and threatened. Of course that's important, but it's very important as well that just as we respect MPs as fellow party members, as fellow citizens and human beings, it's important as well that members of parliament respect those who, unlike them, aren't paid £75,000 a year for their contribution to politics. MPs have made their nominations for leader. And, is anybody from East Leeds here? Yeah. Good to hear it. You'll get your chance as party members in East Leeds next Wednesday to listen to me arguing for Jeremy Corbyn, to listen to someone else arguing for Owen Smith, and you'll get the chance to make your decision as you should do. And I look forward to all the other constituency Labour parties, whether it be Leeds Central, Leeds West, or all the others. I look forward to them giving the members the opportunity. The MPs have had their say, the MPs have nominated. Now it's time for you to be given the dignity and the voice of nominating I want to stop the myth while I'm up here. The myth is that socialists aren't interested in winning. What a load of rubbish. But I won't be taking any lectures from people who lost the last two general elections. <laughs> Anybody would almost think that Labour had won every single election until Jeremy Corbyn took over as leader and then something went wrong. I might be misreading the history books, but we lost in 2015 and we lost in 2010 and we lost 5 million Labour votes between 1997 and 2010. <laughs> in Scotland, in Scotland, some of the people saying that they're irresponsibly heading for the actual disaster. Some of those people engineered the greatest defeat in the Labour Party's history. The decimation of Labour in Scotland from 48 MPs to one MP. And at the same time, at the same time, the bond of trust between the Labour Party and the public frayed to almost breaking point. So I think that maybe our ideas of how to win elections should be listened to as well. And as Imran has mentioned, there have been parliamentary by-election victories under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. Oldham, which we won with an increased percentage of the votes. Sheffield, which we won with an increased percentage of the votes. Tooting, which we won with an increased percentage of the votes. And Ogmore, which we won well as well. And as Imran said, and I don't mind repeating people. Usually I repeat myself, I'm happy to repeat Imran, a West Yorkshire lad like me. We won in Liverpool, in Bristol, in Salford and in London. Those mayor elections. I want to take a special mention of our excellent mayor in Bristol, Marvin Rees, because he was a candidate a few years ago. An excellent candidate who, despite his vision, despite his ability, despite his phenomenal work rate, 
Sadly, Labour didn't win when he stood from there a few years ago. But this time, the combination of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership and his ideas and the phenomenal candidate in Marvin Rees saw us walk the mayoral election in Bristol. <laughs> and we've got decent results in council elections too, particularly here in Leeds. And don't forget that Labour was two points ahead in the polls on the morning of the European Union referendum results. Our position in the polls has plummeted since. Why? I can probably give you about 172 reasons why. <laughs> it's a great shame that colleagues who I call friends, colleagues who I still respect, Colleagues who I'm still proud to campaign alongside, it was a great shame they left the Tories off the hook. This manufactured leadership row, taking the Conservatives off the front page and putting us on the front page for all the bad reasons instead. Imran was right to say, we are interested in winning. We've won before, we've won again. We are about winning power with principle. That's what we're about. It's not a choice between one or the other. And I do want to make mention of the fact I'm very proud to be serving in the Shadow Cabinet uh, under Jeremy's leadership as Shadow Justice Secretary. And I do want to make a couple of points about uh, that position. I was a lawyer, a trade union lawyer, doing employment tribunal work here in Leeds. Uh, and I did that for 10 years before being elected uh, as an MP. And I remember, I remember the day, yeah, it was work around the board, it was not <laughs> 10 years of achievements. <laughs> it's a bit David Brent now, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> Joking apart, I remember the day when I lodged an employment tribunal claim for an unfairly treated worker for the first time since the Conservative Lib Dem Coalition had introduced employment tribunal fees. And I'll never forget how I felt when I looked at the computer when I finished filling in the form online and it said, customer, please enter your credit card details. Doesn't that say a lot when people attempting to assert their statutory right to be paid the minimum wage, when people attempting to assert the statutory right not to be sexually harassed at work, when people attempting to assert the statutory rights not to be subjected to disability discrimination at work, isn't it a sad state of affairs when they're viewed as consumers or customers and not as citizens attempting to assert their statutory rights? <laughs> and when, when I read one late rainy night, the 2015 Labour Party General Election Manifesto, which I was very pleased and proud to stand on, contained some good policies. When I read that, maybe it was a lawyer in me, maybe it was a cynic in me, the paragraph on employment tribunal fees, I didn't quite understand. It said, we will abolish the Conservatives' unfair employment tribunal fee system. Now, what did that mean? Did it mean we were going to reduce the fees? Reduce them by a bit? Reduce them by a lot. No ifs, no buts. A Labour government with Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister and myself as Justice Secretary will abolish employment tribunal fees. No ifs, no buts. To pursue a policy of access to justice for all. Because if everyone doesn't have access to justice, then justice is just a theory. Not a reality. And if Jeremy Corbyn is elected with your help as Prime Minister, then we will have a Labour Prime Minister and the Justice Secretary who thinks that there are some things in society, some things in life which should be subjected to the profit motive. And I'll tell you this, our prison system is one of them. I don't believe that the incarceration of human beings should be making millionaires have the opportunity to live in bigger mansions to begin with. Forgive me if I'm being over simplistic, but I think it's just morally wrong. And that's what our politics has to be about. If our politics isn't about, we can be doing better things on a Saturday night than listen to me rant on. <laughs> And I'm nearly finished, don't worry. The truth is that the current way of doing things isn't working.
for the majority. And I do want to use our city of Leeds as a case study. We hear talk of a northern powerhouse. I'm afraid I just think it's southern hot air and no amount, no amount of fancy buildings, no amount of glitter for the minority can erase the fact that 20% of people in our city live in poverty and hundreds of thousands of people in our city are on the very edge of it. By and large, since 1979, whichever party has been in power, despite all the good things we did do in government between 1997 and 2010, whichever party has been in power, by and large, neoliberal economics, free market fundamentalism has by and large ruled the roost. And what has that period of neoliberalism resulted in? That period of neoliberalism has resulted in the fact that these days, a 21-year-old leaving university in East Leeds or in Leeds has less chance of a council house, less chance of a mortgage, less chance of a well-paid, secure job than a 15-year-old leaving school with no qualifications had 40 years ago. And the system isn't working for us, and we do need change. For the first time in 100 years, working class people face the reality that they can't say with any confidence that their children will do better than they did or have more opportunities than they did. And I think that our communities and our children deserve better than politicians posing for photos on former pits and factory sites telling our kids they should be grateful for living in wage jobs. Our people deserve better than that. We deserve better than that. Britain deserves better than that. And the world deserves better than that. And on the subject of Leeds, on the subject of the North, I want to scotch another myth which I kind of managed to successfully scotch in somewhere called Salford last weekend. And that is a myth peddled by people like Polly Toynbee, that well-known proletarian in the garden and elsewhere, that somehow Jeremy doesn't understand working class people, that somehow it's fair to denounce Jeremy as some kind of Islington-obsessed croissant muncher. <laughs> We eat croissants in Leeds as well, and I ain't gonna be I ain't gonna be lectured by colleagues only on what working class people do and don't eat. But on a serious point, on a serious point, there is nothing London centric, uh, centric about Jeremy, however well respected as he is in London, how much positive change he's achieved in London as he has. I'll tell you this. The shadow cabinet of which I'm a member, I'm proud to be a member of it for very many reasons, but I've never seen a shadow cabinet with as many working class northern voices in it as we have now. I'm thinking of people like Angela Lehner, the shadow education secretary. I'm thinking of people like Rebecca Long Bailey, the shadow treasury minister. I'm thinking of people like ex striking minor Dave Anderson. I'm thinking of people like Graham Norris and many others besides. And by the way, when I say Northern Voices, I don't just mean people who happen to represent Northern constituencies. I mean working class people from those Northern constituencies representing those Northern constituencies. I don't want to bring my remarks to a conclusion by talking Feel free to cheer when Sam near the finish, it's fine. <laughs> By talking about the concepts of leadership, isn't it true that a lot of learning has been going on recently? In the course of this struggle, and it has been a struggle, I've learned a lot about myself, I've learned a lot about you, I've learned a lot about my friends and comrades in Parliament, in the Labour movement and beyond. But some other people have learned as well, or maybe they've failed to learn the lesson. Did didn't they understand Jeremy Corbyn? Haven't they been watching for the past 30 years? Did they think that he was a conventional Westminster politician? Did they think that if you get 15 shadow cabinet 
members to resign on TV or otherwise it goes. Oh, fair play, I understand the rules. Never mind about 600,000 members. I'm off home, that was good. Cheers. <laughs> She's never going to do it. Because... <laughs> if people couldn't stop Jeremy Corbyn speaking up for gay rights when they demonised him for doing it, then Shadow Cabinet members resigning not going to make him do either. If they couldn't stop him arguing for peace negotiations in Northern Ireland by disgracing and defying the terrorists, then 15 Shadow Cabinet members resigning wasn't going to get into Shadow Fever. If they couldn't stop him speaking out against the free market fundamentalists, politics and economics which created the banking crisis and has made people here in Leeds pay the price for a crisis which they didn't cause, then they weren't going to get however long the string of resignations was. They weren't going to let him give up on this project. They weren't going to persuade him to give up on all of you. So, Jeremy Corbyn has showed steel. Jeremy Corbyn has showed conviction. Jeremy Corbyn has shown the power of ideas. Jeremy Corbyn has shown, as you have done, the power of collectivism. And I want to finish with a quote by someone not from Leeds, someone <laughs> not from Islington, someone from the Deep South, and by that I don't mean Surrey. <laughs> I mean Martin Luther King, a truly great human being, who said, a true leader doesn't follow the consensus. A true leader shapes the consensus. Yeah. Isn't it the case that Jeremy Corbyn is a true leader? But as Jeremy himself says more eloquently than I, it ain't just about him. It ain't even just about his ideas. It's about all of you. I started off this speech by congratulating you all for making history. When I think of that quote from Martin Luther King, I don't just think of Jeremy Corbyn. I think of all of you, because you are all leaders in your community. You are all leaders collectively in our society. Political change doesn't just come from individual leaders. Political change comes from hundreds of thousands of people get together. So I believe you made history already. I believe together you all make history again. So I thank you for your patience and I salute you for what you've done. And friends, sisters and brothers, I salute you for what you're about to do. Carry on making history together. to grow an olive tree. Oh, no. <laughs> an olive tree of peace, an olive tree of hope, an olive tree from which we can all learn something. And I'm sorry I was a bit late coming into this 
event here in the armories tonight because there was uh, like a thousand people, no trains mate, they worked all right today. Um, I'm getting heckled here on the front row. Um, there was a thousand people outside who couldn't get in here because of health and safety requirements. Thank you all of them for patiently waiting outside and I went out to talk to them earlier. So And at that point, it was the biggest rally we'd ever held as part of the leadership campaign. And it taught me something. It taught me something about the way in which if you give people the opportunity to express their hopes, their views, their ambitions, their determination to achieve a better society, then our party is made stronger, more people come on board, and we achieve much more, and we're not dictated to by those above us. It's our strength, our people coming together. And so when Richard was talking earlier and put the case so well of what his life is about, what his work is about, and what our society is about, I want to say a big thank you to him, to Imran, and the other members of the shadow team we've got in all the positions that they hold. When the problems started on the day after the European referendum, Richard Bergen didn't walk away, Imran Hussain didn't walk away, John McDonald didn't walk away, Diane Abbott didn't walk away. So many more didn't walk away. They stepped up and took on the responsibility of taking the fight to the Tories, of putting it out there for the kind of society that we want to create. And I'm very grateful to all of them for that and all that they do. Because these are very important and very serious times for ordinary people in this country and indeed in the wider world. Somebody said to me in a BBC interview, just before I went to the Durham Miners Gala. They almost looked sympathetic. <laughs> almost. <laughs> and they said, uh, Mr. Corbyn, how are you coping with the pressure you're being put under? <laughs> and I simply said this, you don't know what pressure is. <laughs> pressure is when you've got nowhere to live. Pressure is when you can't feed your children. Pressure is when you don't know what's going to happen to you. Pressure is when you're unemployed. Pressure is inequality, injustice, the misery of our society. None of us are under any pressure. We're proud and honoured to do the job you've given us to do and the responsibility you've given us to carry out. That is why we, all of us here tonight, are in this hall. Think about three examples of injustice and inequality that's going on in Britain today. There's a man who's in Monte Carlo this evening on his yacht. I'm sure the weather's nice. It always is in Monte Carlo. And, um, Back home, things aren't so nice. BHS is closed down. Thousands of people lost their jobs. Thousands of people in the supply chain lost their jobs. The profits went to a tax haven. The pension fund is in problems. The public are gonna to have to intervene to back up those people who may lose their pensions. What is it about modern Britain that somehow or other somebody that salts the assets of a company away into a tax haven, presides over the collapse of a well-known high street chain, is somehow or other worthy of being a minister in the past, of being extolled as great virtue, when in reality, it's a spiv economy run by spivs and protected by the same kind of people. Example of the way in which those that have given their lives to work in that company are somehow or other dis 
regarded. Lloyds Bank, partly owned by all of us because we're very generous people. We bailed out Lloyds Bank in 2008. All of us, we gave a lot of money to them. And we bailed out RBS and lots of them. We're very generous people. We saw bankers in trouble. And We let them carry on as they were before. And Lloyd's has now turned itself round. It's made 2.5 billion in profits this year. 101% increase on last year. It's a lot of money, they're doing very well. Now, most of us, if we're doing really well, to get a bonus at work or something, you say to your kids, well, you know, done well this year, I'll give you a bonus. Here's 50 quid, go and enjoy yourself. But these directors of Lloyd's are not the same as us. <laughs> so they've given 3,000 people a really special letter. Thanks for your work. Kindly resign. Go away. You're dismissed. You are surplus to requirements and 200 branches are going to be closed. Isn't it time we use our public ownership share of these banks to make them work in a responsible way? examples of inequality in modern Britain. My great friend Dennis Skinner intervened. Yeah. Dennis sends his uh, support and regards and I tell you what a fantastic friend and comrade Dennis has been over a lot of years to all of us in lots of struggles and lots of glory. John McDonald was speaking in Parliament on a different economic strategy, a strategy of investment, a strategy of growth, a strategy of security, of an economy that works for all. And John was doing very well. And Dennis said, will you give way? And John, said, John looked at, of course. Dennis got up and he said, isn't an example of the failure of the British economy this? He worked down the pit at Shirebrook. He dug coal. He was in the union like everybody else that worked down the pit. They didn't care what nationality they were, what ethnic group they were, or anything else. They worked together down the pit. They were paid together. They were in the union together. They were in the community together. It was a strong, proud, working class community that was there. Thatcher came along, destroyed the mining industry, tried to destroy the NUM and didn't succeed, and uh, the pit closed. What's it been replaced by now? Mike Ashley, Sport Direct. Zero hours contract, not even the average of the minimum wage paid to most of the staff there. Frequently, the ambulance is caused, called there because uh, people have fallen ill. The fire brigade are called there. Can I get some water, please? Uh, <laughs> very much. Water is free. It's your water. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard Burke, for the water. And that place is um, a bad place to work, insecure employment. That is an example of what modern Britain has become. And so, in our campaign, to change the direction of the Labour Party, we've done a couple of things. First of all, by appointing John MacDonald as Shadow Chancellor Exchequer, we appointed somebody who has a totally different approach to the economy to George Osborne, Philip Hammond, or anybody else. John's, economy, John's idea of a working economy is one that doesn't rely on inequality, doesn't rely on low pay, doesn't rely on insecure working conditions. And that is important. And John has put forward the alternative. And you know what? When you put forward the alternative, people say, well, that's a bit extreme, that's not going to work, no, you can't do that. <laughs> no, I don't do that, don't go down that road. And then they realise that actually a lot of people out there think, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> go there. So, uh, very good idea, yeah, we're all on board with that now. Good, I'm really glad they're all on board with that now. Because, come the general election, whenever it comes, we're going to be very clear. We're going to end zero hours contracts. We're going to bring in the property of the We're going to provide rights of work. We're going to end tribunal things. 
We're going to give rights to trade union arrangements. We're going to repeal the trade union act. All of this is a part of the policy that we are putting forward. Because we believe that everyone in work should have rights, rights to representation, rights to protection, rights to be heard, and rights to put their ideas forward to develop our economy. How many of you work in companies where you've got really good ideas? You know, we could make something different. We could do that better. Yeah, okay. And you say to your manager, I've got some different ideas. Tell so shut up, go away, and get on with your work. Sorry, we want an atmosphere and an approach which actually enhances everything we do, but also unlocks the skills that we've all got. Surely that is something we can do a lot better. So we put forward those ideas, and therefore we want Workplace 2020, led by Ian Lavery, which is about developing a wholly different approach to rights at work come the general election of 2020 or sooner. And that would include the rights of self-employed as well as employed people, because everyone can be exploited in all kinds of circumstances. And we need to bring people together, not right them apart. The issues that we face of inequality are not just of income level and of poverty. If you took a bus across Leeds, a bus across Birmingham, a bus across Glasgow, or indeed a bus across London. You would go from relatively comfortably off suburbs, where life expectancy is in the high 80s or even 90s, and you go through areas that get poorer and poorer, and the life expectancy falls as a result of that. None of that is necessary, and none of that is right. And so we're, if we're serious about developing a more equal society where everyone has a real chance, then we've got to deal with all the issues of inequality. Because if you keep people locked in poverty, if children grow up in grossly overcrowded, insecure accommodation, they do less well in school, less likely to get to college, less likely to get to university, less likely to be able to contribute to our society. Two things come from that. One is those youngsters achieve less than they could have done, their potential in their lives. We all lose out. We've lost out on an engineer. We've lost out on a doctor. We've lost out on a nurse. We've lost out on somebody who could achieve so much more. And so we have to start by recognising the absolute central, vital value and importance of a national health service free at the point of use, healthcare as a human right, not a commodity. <laughs> that was the greatest, the greatest achievement of the post-war Labour government out of Anarin Bevan. He wanted a national health service because he'd grown up in the mining valleys of South Wales. He had seen the injustice, the inequality, particularly when people couldn't afford a doctor. And he wanted something very different. And he said many things, but one of them was, the NHS will last as long as there's folk around to defend it. Well, we're here to defend it, but I tell you this, this government isn't defending it. This government chose to attack the junior doctors rather than support them in what they were trying to do. This government has chosen to privatise 49% of all NHS services. This government systematically underfunds not just the health service, but also adult social care. So you get desperately needy, frail elderly people stuck in hospitals because the adult social care service can't deal with them. We don't want a health service that is a battle of emails between different public sector organisations about who should not take care of somebody. We want a system that takes care of everybody as an urgency. <laughs> if they're allowed to carry on as they are, the underfunding will continue, the queues will lengthen, the waiting times and waiting lists will lengthen, 
and those that can afford it will be tempted more and more into private medicine. The restrictions on expensive medicines on the NHS will get deeper and deeper. And suddenly you'll wake up one day and find the NHS is not the first port of call for every one of us, but the health service of last resort for those that can't afford to go private. <laughs> So I'm very serious about this. Our absolute priority is a properly funded National Health Service so that we can continue. And also recognise the mental health crisis that exists in this country. We're a big, we're a big audience tonight. There's a lot of us here. A lot, of, a lot of us here, there's several thousand people here tonight. One in four of us, at some point in our lives, is going to go through a mental health crisis, a stress crisis. We might be lucky, we might have a very understanding partner, family, friends, who will look after us, help us, and help us get through it and recognise it is something that could happen to anybody. We might have a good system locally that will help us get through. But then again, we might not. Or then again, we might be a young person in school or a student in university or college who is frightened of the stigma of saying they're going through a mental health crisis to tell anybody about it. We've got to change the language, the mood music and the approach towards the mental health crisis. We start by doing it ourselves in the way that we treat and respect each other. It's that important, that vital, and so vital that we do it. Because some people are frightened to talk about it for reasons of stigma, yes, reasons of uh, what their friends might think of them, what might say to them, but also what their employer might think of them, where their career prospects go to, and all that that go goes with it. So let's reach out as a movement, as a party, to change the language on that and push this government as hard as we can, but look forward to a Labour government that will properly fund the mental health service. There are so many other areas of innovation that to talk about, but one that is so strong and so important is the question of housing within our society. I mentioned earlier the insecurity of children growing up not knowing where they're going to be living a few weeks or a few months later, wondering why their box of toys is endlessly packed up and taken somewhere else and unpacked again, why they have to keep moving school, why they sometimes have to keep moving town altogether. What does it do to them? What does it do to their psyche, their sense of security? What does it do to the sense of community? We're a nation now of a very large proportion living in the private rented sector and it's got increasing very, very fast. Isn't it time that public law caught up with it and we had greater security, much longer tenancies, much fairer rents, much better conditions in the private rental sector? And what we're up against is a Tory government and a coalition government before that that didn't understand it or didn't care, it, care about it. So when Theresa Pearce, a Labour MP, proposed an amendment to the last housing bill, now the Housing Act that went through, simply saying, it was really extreme, you know, she's kind of far left, Labour extremist, and blah, 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 everything that the Daily Mail really doesn't like, um, said, every home that's put on the private rented market should be fit for human habitation. Yeah. Really extreme stuff. Way off, way off, baby, well done. You know what, they, the Tories voted it down. Sorry, it's going to be us. It's going to be the Labour movement that brings in real protection, real security, and real regulation in the private rental sector. And as an economic forces and the need to support and accommodate the homeless that exist and sleep on our streets all over this country, there is something deeply wrong about that. And I simply say to those 
I've got a relatively well off, living a fairly secure life, got a decent place to live, nice job and everything else. They say, people say to me, well, how do you ever appeal to them? What's labour ever offering to them? I simply say to this, if you're well off and you're doing okay, fine, good luck to you. But are you comfortable when you walk home and you see people sleeping on the streets? Are you comfortable when you see people in a deeply distressed situation begging around the railway stations and the bus stations of this country? Are you really comfortable with the idea of forgotten Britain, those that live on the margins and sadly die on the margins? We're better than that and we can create a society in which everyone matters and everyone can. So those are just some of the areas that we have to deal with on inequality in Britain. And so we're putting forward things that are very different. And I tell you this, it's upset a few people. And there's been an analysis done of the way in which uh, the Labour Party and our politics have been reported over the past year. And um, I won't tell you which newspaper it is, but you <laughs> might be able to guess. There's one paper that has, um, if you take as a hundred the number of articles they've printed about the Labour Party, they've printed far more than that, if you take it a hundred to get the percentage, you'll find that 83 of every hundred articles has been downright hostile to the Labour Party. 17 can be loosely described as informative and neutral. Not one has said anything positive whatsoever about the Labour Party. Then you go through all of our national titles and you find that almost 80% of the coverage has been downright hostile to what we're trying to do. The level of abuse and denigration that's been thrown at us is unprecedented in modern political times in this country. And it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop at the print media. It also, to some extent, infects the national news on all of the broadcasting channels to a varying degree. I simply say that this to them. Yes, you have a duty to report. Yes, you have a duty to robustly report and question what people do. But you also have a duty to fairly report what we're trying to say and trying to do, and not before the level of personal abuse. Now, I personally don't involve myself at any level whatsoever in personal abuse because I'm not prepared to lower myself into that gutter and get involved with it. And I say to all of you here, Put forward our views, put forward our ideas, put forward our policies, put forward our hope, but don't resort to abuse, don't resort to trolling, don't resort to, resort to internet abuse of anybody. It doesn't take anybody anywhere further forward. We're better than that, and we'll always be better than that. Over the past year, we've been trying to put forward these, this different approach and these different ideas. Our rights, our strength, our justice comes from those that went before us. It comes from those people that stood up for the right to vote in the 19th century. The suffragettes who suffered that women might get the right to vote. It's from those people that developed and achieved so much. It also comes from the cultural values we have from great writers, great thinkers, great musicians, great artists, and great poets. So I unashamedly say this to you. In creating a fairer, better, more decent, more equal society, in developing an economy that works for all, do a couple of things. One is, don't allow ourselves to turn in on each other. Be proud of multi-ethnic, multi-faith Britain. Don't turn in on each other and allow racist to take over in any way, in any stretch of the imagination. But also, work, work hard to develop our ideas, but also recognise the culture that's there in all of us. 
Yesterday I was in Durham, sadly, for the funeral of Davy Hopper, the late great Davy Hopper, Secretary of the Durham Miners Association. <laughs> he died a week after the incredible Durham Miners Gala. Wonderful, wonderful man. And the banners that are there around Red Hills, the uh, big building owned by Durham Miners Association, are pure works of art. Works of art, works of hope, works of inspiration, works of aspiration of communities coming together. That was working class art and working class culture being expressed in the only way it could be expressed at that time through the miners union and other unions. It's there on the banners for all to see for all time. I want us to be proud as a community to invest enough in our theatres, in our cinemas, in our arts and provide every child for the chance to study music in school. Every child to be able to act. Every child to be able to develop their hopes and their inspiration and their aspirations. Because it's not one thing that motivates our society. It's a lot of things. When we do things together, when we work together, when we campaign together, when we turn a piece of wasteland and disused land into a park, when we get social housing built, when we get a good hospital built, when we get a good nursery and a good school, when we get better quality jobs and employment, we all benefit and we all achieve together and we get on better as a community together. So the message we're trying to put is of the kind of world that we can live in. We want to live in a world of peace and justice, as Richard has so well explained. We want our foreign policy to be one of human rights, democracy and justice around the world. Not the terrors and horrors of the Iraq war. And we want our option, our offer, our plan, our determination, our endeavour to be how we bring communities together. Recognise the strength that we've got. Recognise the talent that's there in all of us. Recognise the kind of community that we can build. We don't have to be unequal. We don't have to be poor. We don't have to have people sleeping on the streets. We don't have to have grotesque income squirrelled away into tax havens around the world. We can, will and must achieve something very, very different within our society. And so whilst at one level this is an election for the leadership of the Labour Party, a position I'm very proud and honoured to have and will continue to have, I hope, with your support. It's also about how we do our politics in society, how we represent those that have entrusted us. But in reality, we're all representatives, we're all leaders. We're leaders in our community, our workplace, our church, our mosque, our temple, our synagogue, our community centre, wherever else we can lead ideas, lead debate and lead discussion. It's that common endeavour that founded our unions. It's that common endeavour that founded our party. It's that common endeavour that gave us the NHS, the welfare state and so much else. So let's not allow, not allow these Tories to destroy all the things that we've achieved. Let's bring that sense of common endeavour, purpose and unity together to achieve the kind of society where the next generation isn't being told by us, sorry guys, we did pretty well, but unfortunately you won't get the health service, the pensions, schools, the free university places or anything else that we had. We're pulling up the ladder on that. And by the way, the generation that's coming after you, they better look out for themselves because none of that is going to be available. Can't we do something different? Can't we instead say, you won't be saddled with 50k of debt because you went to university? Can't we say instead, you're going to get somewhere to live? Can't we say instead, you're going to be able to develop yourself and your community and we'll deal with the level of injustice and inequality in our society? That is what makes the politics of now so exciting. Here, across Europe, across the USA and across the world, people are saying no to the neoliberal economic model that rolls back the public state and increases inequality and injustice within our society and ignores the environmental needs of our country and indeed of the whole planet. 
Let's be together, strong together, imaginative together, powerful together, achieving together, defeating the problem.